Hi everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. This week we are gonna be talking about communion, the Lord's Supper. What is communion and why do we do it? We are going through the book of Matthew in this Bible study, and as we're going through the text, we talk about the things that come up. And today, we are looking at the passages, Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 30. And in this time, we are going to see Jesus, the Last Supper, and him explain communion and what it is. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. At the end of this talk, we are actually going to take communion together. So, if you are not driving, I would suggest you grab your elements. So grab a piece of bread. It can be anything that represents bread. It can be a piece of toast. Uh, it can be um, a saltine, a Ritz cracker, a graham cracker. Um, I have a loaf of bread and I also have naan and we'll talk about this uh, in a second. This is uh, unleavened flatbread is the idea there. And then grab your cup. Now you can choose uh, anything basically to represent the cup. I have a bottle of wine here that's unopened, and then I have my grape juice. Um, grab whatever you like that represents these two elements, pause the video, and then go grab those elements and bring them back because we're gonna talk about all of this. Okay, so before we get into Matthew 26, 17, why don't you bow your heads and let's pray. And again, if you're driving, you can pray with your eyes open. Please do. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for this time that we have. I pray that you will honor this time for those people that are, are listening and watching this, Lord, that you would um, teach them about your word, teach them about the new covenant that is made uh, through you and represented by communion. Lord, we love you. We are so grateful for this time. Please bless this time. Lord, please speak through me. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome, guys. Okay, so we are gonna be covering Matthew 26, 17 through 30. So to start out with, let's just read through this. So follow along with me. <clears throat> On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12, and while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to one another, surely you do not mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as it's written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who had betrayed him, who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. You have said so, Jesus answered. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Okay, so let's dig into this just a little bit. Um, we've talked about this before. Um, they are in Jerusalem, uh, and they are there at the same time as the uh, Passover celebration is, is underway. This is Thursday of Holy Week, and they're getting ready to celebrate the Passover Seder. This is a, a celebration, a meal that is still celebrated to this day amongst both Jews as well as Christians. If you have the opportunity, if your church does a Seder dinner, go check it out. It's really fascinating. I've participated in several and it's really fun to see um, the traditions of a Jewish Seder, all of the different meals, not meals, but the different uh, elements. There's, there's different courses that you eat throughout the night. There's different uh, cups. Uh, there's the first cup, second cup, third cup, and then there's the different elements that you eat, uh, the bitter herbs, there's all sorts of different things. It's an amazing, fascinating um, 
picture that when you look at it from a Christian perspective represents Christ. Now we've spoken about this before. What is Passover? What is the celebration of Passover? Well, as I've mentioned several times, but I'm gonna say it yet again, Passover is the celebration of the event that happened in Exodus back in Egypt in which the Egyptians were in captivity under Pharaoh and God through Moses and his brother Aaron brought down plagues on Egypt to cause Pharaoh to release the Egyptians. Pharaoh had his heart hardened and he refused to allow the Egyptians who were the slaves of Egypt to be set free as God desired them to be. The very final plague, the last one that is brought down, the angel of death comes over all of the homes in Egypt and kills the firstborn of every household. Except for those who follow God's command through Moses and slaughter and sacrifice the Passover lamb. This is a, uh, a one-year-old, spotless, perfect lamb that is slain and, and prepared just as uh, the description is in Exodus. Um, it's prepared with herbs, uh, and even it, there's even descriptions on how they're supposed to eat it. You're actually supposed to eat it with your shoes on and your jacket on, with the idea being that, get ready to go. The time is coming. You are about to leave. You are going to leave Egypt. You are going to be uh, taken out of slavery and bondage. But then there's specific instructions where you're supposed to take the blood of the sacrificial lamb, uh, take some hyssop, which is basically a sponge, and put it on the doorpost. And then what happened is that then the angel of death, when it came over Egypt, it passed over those houses that had sacrificed the lamb and put the blood on the, the doorpost. That, as I've spoken about before, is a picture of Christ. That is Christ. That is why Christ is called the Lamb, the Lamb of God that was sacrificed to save all of us from the angel of death. And we're going to get into that even more so. But that is what they're celebrating. And if you read it in Exodus, you'll actually see that the Lord commands the Jews to continue indefinitely to celebrate every year to celebrate the Passover. So, as I've spoken about before, you have a, a, a lot of people that have traveled into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And we look at that here, that they are now celebrating, they're do, they, they are having a Seder, the, the Passover Seder meal, they are celebrating it, the disciples are celebrating it together. Now, one of the things that happens, uh, the disciples say, where do you want uh, us to prepare the Passover meal? And Jesus, uh, we see something happen here that's very similar to what happened in Matthew 21. For those of you who have been following along, you'll recall that Matthew 21, when Jesus, before he has his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, he instructs uh, his disciples to go in very specific terms to this spot, find this man, there you will find a donkey and its colt tied up in this specific space. The owner is gonna ask you, what are you doing? You say the Lord has need of these. And it, it, it's very specific. In the same way here, uh, we see this same story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke gives this same uh, uh, testimony of this story. Matthew is brief. And I like that about Matthew. He just, he gets straight to the point. From Luke, we get a little bit more detail about um, the two disciples that actually go um, to find the house where they're going to celebrate the, the Passover meal. And there's even more specific details. There'll be a man with a jar of water. You are to go to him and say that, that our master, our Lord, um, needs to celebrate the Passover in your home. Show us your spare room. I mean, it's very specific. Um, which I think, just like in Matthew 21, is a perfect example of situations in our lives where you'll have a nudging. You'll have God telling you you're supposed to do something. It might seem kind of odd, but you go to do it, and when you follow that, that influence, that uh, inspiration, the Holy Spirit pushing you, oftentimes it's amazing how you'll interact with somebody who felt a similar nudging. And whatever it is, and, and I do believe that that is what's happening here, is, is that the Holy Spirit had been working on this guy um, to open up his home to, to allow Jesus and the disciples to celebrate the Last Supper and to celebrate the Passover in their home, in his home. Um, okay, so go into the city, a certain man, uh, and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near, I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. 
When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table. And now keep in mind, this isn't a table like what we have with table and chairs. Historical cultural context, tables were much lower and they would sit on pillows around the table together. So Jesus is hanging out with his friends, is the idea here, around the table. And while they were eating, this is the Passover Seder that they're eating together. They're following uh, um, the, the Passover Seder and the different elements that they're eating. Jesus says, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They are very sad and begin to say to one another, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Then Jesus says, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. He's not saying that right in that moment. The idea there is, uh, the one who's been eating with me, the one who's been at my table, it's one of you, it's one of my friends. One of you is going to betray me. Uh, and then, this is an interesting quote, is, is that the Son of Man, Jesus says, the Son of Man will go, just as it's written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. So an important thing to note here is that Judas fulfills a role. Jesus was going to go to the cross regardless. It's going to happen. And Judas fulfills a role in that process. The same thing uh, with, the, the, uh, with Caiaphas, um, the, the high priest, and the Sanhedrin. Everything happened exactly as it was supposed to happen. So who is responsible for Jesus' death? Who is responsible for Jesus going to the cross? Is it Judas? Is it Caiaphas? Is it the Jews? It's an interesting question, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, before the end of this talk. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. And then Jesus answers in such a subtle way as to acknowledge it, but not point it out for everybody. And Jesus says, you have said so. Which is an interesting thing to say is that, that well, you say so. So he's not admitting in front of everybody, this is the guy, um, but he is saying, well, that's what you're saying. Jesus answered, you have said so. Uh, verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. Okay, I'm gonna pause right here. We need to do some background information. This, what's about to happen, is the fulfillment or the representation or what we are supposed to do in remembrance and acknowledgement of the new covenant. So in order for me to explain that, we well, need to understand the old covenant. So let's talk a little bit about the old covenant. So covenants, well, here's an interesting thing. Covenant, another word for covenant is testament. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible, right? So we are in Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament. So I've divided it right here. This section here is what we call the Old Testament, or it is in the Jewish perspective, it's just the Bible, it's just their word, it's scripture, it's uh, the Torah. And then we have the New Testament, which is also the New Covenant, and that is the division. What is the one thing that divides these two elements? Jesus. Jesus is the division. Jesus is the fulfillment of the New Covenant. Okay, so let's talk about covenants just a little bit. Covenant theology, what is that? A covenant is simply an agreement. It's a contract. So you have, throughout the Old Testament, there are quite a few different covenants that, that are in here. You have some covenants that are conditional, and you have some that are unconditional. The Abrahamic covenant, that is an unconditional covenant that still exists to this day. What is the Abrahamic covenant? That is a covenant that God made with Abraham, and you can find that, that is in uh, Genesis. Um, we see the Abrahamic covenant in which there's a couple things that are laid out in that. Um, specifically, this is where, G, where God calls out Israel as his chosen people. He says to Abraham that he's going to make a mighty nation, a great nation, descendants as numerous as the stars or the sand on the seashore. He also, in the Abrahamic covenant, he specifically spells out the promised land, the land that the Jews will eventually fully occupy, but still to this day have never fully received all the land that God promised. Another element that, that's in the Abrahamic covenant 
is a, a very interesting verse that's an important one for us today. And that is found in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. That single line is over the entire people of Israel. And I believe it's still held to this day. Uh, Israel is a cup of trembling, is what the Bible describes it as. And, and the idea being is, is that those nations that support Israel as a nation will be blessed. Those that curse Israel as a nation will in themselves be cursed. And I think that you can see that happening. And there have actually been studies that have been done. There's been books that have written that talk about a direct correlation to every time the United States does something to bless Israel, a correspondence of a blessing that comes back to us. And every time we've done something to curse Israel, now it's not like we're saying curse Israel, but when we say we wanna go back to the 67 borders where we, we wanna read, we wanna divide um, Jerusalem in half, those are elements that, that are hindering Israel. And some would argue that we then receive a negative repercussion for any time we do that. That is the Abrahamic covenant. There's a lot more uh, imparted in it. It's quite large, but it's unconditional, meaning the Jews don't have to do a single thing and it plays out, okay? The Jews are God's chosen people and that is the Abrahamic covenant. Well, so then moving forward from there, you have um, Abraham, who has a son, Isaac, who has a son, Jacob. Jacob, is his name is changed to Israel, and Jacob then has 12 sons. Uh, Joseph is one of those 12 sons, and as you recall, Joseph, that's an amazing story uh, uh, about how Joseph is sold into slavery and then goes into Potiphar's house in Egypt, and then through an amazing series of events, um, Joseph ends up becoming uh, number two in all of Egypt under Pharaoh and saves Egypt, and then through that, he actually saves Israel and his brothers. Then you have 400 years in which Israel is living in Egypt. You're getting a whole history lesson here. In which Israel is living in Egypt and because they are so numerous, they end up being um, taken into slavery over time by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And it starts out as when, they, when, the, when Israel first comes to Egypt, they take on the role of being shepherds because that's what they were. The uh, Israel as a group were shepherds of flocks. That's what they're described as being. And in Egypt, the most loathsome job you could do is being a shepherd. So at any rate, sorry, they're in captivity. Uh, they become slaves and they grow uh, in massive numbers, but then the, the captivity becomes extremely harsh under Pharaoh and they cry out to God. And then through Moses and his brother Aaron, you see the story of Exodus, the story of Moses um, and God freeing his people from the captivity in which the last plague I've already talked about, that's Passover. Well, then the Jews are freed from Egypt. They cross the parting of the Red Sea, Moses then goes and they collectively worship God at Mount Sinai. This is where we see the old covenant. This is the Mosaic covenant. This is the 10 commandments. This is a whole series of rules and laws. You have the 10 commandments, but then you have a whole series of additional commandments that, that are above that, that are all these rules, that the basic idea is, is that this is a series of rules to protect Israel, to keep them safe, and to keep them following God's way. Now, I'm gonna check my notes to make sure I'm going along the right path. Yep, I mentioned all of that. Mount Sinai, great, 10 commandments, yep. Um, Exodus 20, that's where we send the 10 commandments, great. So one of the things that you see is the setup of a sacrificial system. This is the Levitical priesthood and the tabernacle. So the tabernacle is uh, the temple, but it's in a tent form. It is, uh, and you can, you can look this up. It's amazing to see all the elements that are in the tabernacle. Uh, there's a fence that goes around the outside. You have the outer court. You have the tent that's actually set up. You have the altar of sacrifice. You have uh, the, the candle, the, the menorah. You have um, the holy place, the most holies, the holy of holies. You have the Ark of the Covenant, which within the Ark of the Covenant, you had the Ten Commandments, um, among other things. And then you 
had the cherubim on top of the Ark of the Covenant, which actually had the presence of God, was right there on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And then you had the Levitical priesthood. These are Aaron's descendants of the family of Levi that were responsible for the priesthood, the sacrificial system. The idea was that the Jews were supposed to follow the rules and to sacrifice for the atonement of sin. And a specific Bible verse that I want to read is Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Atonement is a very key word here. So the idea is, God says to the Jews, follow my commandments, and I will bless you. This is a conditional covenant. It's an agreement between God and the people of Israel. God says, if this, then that. The Jews say, yes, we accept that. We will do this. The whole rest of the Old Testament is an amazing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth of the Jews following God's commandment, following his rules, following uh, his guide, his way, and being blessed. And then they stop following him and they start going on their own path. They start worshiping other idols. They start worshiping um, Baal and Astrith and, and Diana. And they start following other gods and, uh, and, and worshiping themselves, basically. And then God sends, first you have the judges, then you have the kings, and then you have the prophets. He sends people to say, over and over and over again, you see it all throughout the Old Testament. God say, plead with Israel and say, look, repent, turn, please follow the commandments that I've laid out for you. It's designed for your benefit. Follow these, you will be safe, and I will then bless you. But if you don't, I will pull my blessing from you. I will scatter you throughout the lands, and, and you will receive desolation. You will be scattered. This is the diaspora. And this happens back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it's like when you read through the Old Testament, it's like, oh my gosh, seriously, why won't you guys get it? And even, even when they're wandering in the desert, it's amazing to me that they literally see miracle after miracle after miracle. They're fed daily by God. And yet they still, they still turn. They still turn. They still uh, want to worship a golden calf. They still want to do all of these things in disobedience to God. So it's this, the Old Testament is, is pictures and examples over and over and over again that point to the necessity of a new system, a new covenant. And this is the thing, is all throughout the Old Testament, we see prophecies, prophecies that are made of a coming Messiah, we see a foreshadowing and, and prophecies of a new covenant that is to come. Specifically, I want to read 2 Chronicles 7.7. 7. So let's open up to 2 Chronicles. Oh, I have not been uh, in here. I've had the Bible closed for most of this talk, which is kind of crazy for me. Um, okay, so 2 Chronicles 7.11. Okay, so um, just to preface this real quick. We have the tabernacle system. This is the temple, but it is in tent form. And the reason being is, is that the Jews, when they're traveling around the desert, they are nomads. They are a traveling people that do not have a home. And so the, the tabernacle needs to be portable. And so it was, it was a tent system. And it stayed that way. It stayed that way from when they're wandering around the desert. It stayed that way when they uh, took and started taking possession of the promised land. And then you see throughout um, uh, the kings, you see in First and Second Samuel, you see the possession of the promised land. Then you see the kings come into position. You see Saul as the first king. Then you see King David. King David has huge success and the Philistines are, are, are almost annihilated under King David. And King David says, I am living in a palace made of wood. I should also make a palace for the Lord. And God says, no, you are, you have blood on your hands. You are a warrior. You are, uh, you have conquered. It's not your place to build me an actual house. That's your son's job. So who's his son? Solomon. And let's pick this up. So we have 2 Chronicles 7, 11. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal place and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, 
the Lord appeared to him at night and said. So David had a vision to create the temple, but God says, nope, that's your son's job. And so David did pass along along to him the plans that King David had for the temple it is a gorgeous, gorgeous structure. And you can see the, the, the dimensions of it are spelled out. It's massive. It's absolutely massive. It's made with cedars from Lebanon, but then it's gold plated everywhere. There's gold everywhere. Everything is surrounded by gold, this amazing structure. And these plans are given to Solomon. And as soon as Solomon finishes the temple, God says this to him. I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated the temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully as David, your father did, and do all I command and observe, my decrees and my laws... I will establish your royal throne as I coveted it with David your father when I said you shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. So this is a repeating of the old covenant. This is the Mosaic covenant. This is the promise that he made at the very beginning to Israel, Mount Sinai. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all the people. This temple will become a heap of rubble. And that does happen. All who pass by will be appalled and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why he brought all this disaster on them. So that's the old covenant. It is a conditional agreement between God and Israel if you do this, then this will happen. If you don't, then this will happen. The sacrificial system under the priests and the Levitical priests was established, and there were daily sacrifices that were done, sacrifices, uh, there was incense that was put up, there was daily sacrifices of, you had birds and goats and, and rams and bulls and all sorts of different sacrifices. And then once a year on the Day of Atonement, that's Yom Kippur, in the Holy of Holies, this is the place inside the tabernacle. It was God's resting place among the Jews. That was where God lived. Once a year, the high priest and the high priest only, with a rope around his foot, would go into the Holy of Holies. But, but first, he would make an offering for his own sins so that when he went in, he would, he would be cleansed. And then he would make atonement in the Holy of Holies in the presence of God for the people of Israel once a year. That is the foundation of the Old Covenant. Now, let me make sure I've, I've read all of this. Ah, so the last thing I wanna mention before we go into the New Covenant is I wanna flip over to Jeremiah 31. So Jeremiah is one of the prophets. Let's flip over Jeremiah 31, verse 31. 31, 31, Jeremiah 31, 31. This is a great passage that's a foreshadowing of the new covenant. This is a prophecy, with, prof, a prophecy within the old covenant, within the Old Testament that the prophet Jeremiah is going to make. This is Jeremiah 31, 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. 
though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. An important thing to note, at this time in the Old Testament, it was the job and the role of the priests to administer the sacrifices. And it was the job of the priests to make atonement for the sins. But you could not, a, a, an everyday person, well, let me make this clear. You have Jews and Gentiles. So a good Jewish person couldn't even go into the temple. That was the place for the Levitical priest. Only a priest could go there and only the highest priest could go into the Holy of Holies and be in the presence of God. And that was only able to be done once a year. This is implying that coming in a new covenant, that system will be gone in which everybody is able to know me and be in my presence. It is a prophecy of a new covenant that is to come. Okay, so now, now let's talk about the new covenant. So what is the new covenant? So now we're getting into the New Testament and we're getting into Jesus. Okay, so this is, uh, excuse me, I had to take a little drink. Christianity 101. This is the essential doctrine. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice that was made once for all. The idea here is that God, knowing at the very beginning of time, knowing this whole system's gonna come in, into play, designed this so that the Old Testament is pointing to the New Testament, and the Old Testament is full of prophecies of a, of a coming Messiah and prophecies of a new covenant. In fact, if you were to take this book and, and cut off, actually, that's not accurate, that's in Jeremiah, yep. There you go. If you were to take the New Testament and cut it off and just have the Old Testament, it's a scary book. It is an unfinished, uh, sad story that, that is just uh, a foreshadowing and pointing to something that, that, that the Jews are longing for, something that, that completes it, and that's what we have in the New Testament. But God, at the very beginning of everything, knew this was going to be happening. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, existed before creation. Jesus existed at the very beginning. In fact, you have the, uh, what's it called? Right after the fall, the Proto-Evangelium. Fancy word, Proto-Evangelium. What is the Proto-Evangelium? Write it down, look it up. It's in Genesis 3, right after the fall. This is the first mention of the idea of the Messiah. And this is where God says to the serpent, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That right there, that line is a foreshadowing, a prophecy. That's the Proto-Evangelium. He is Jesus, will crush your head. That's Satan. That's the power that Satan has over mankind will be crushed in one blow with Christ. That's he you will bruise his heel. Jesus had to go to the cross. In order for our sins to be forgiven, he had to go to the cross. That is the essence of the new covenant, is this idea that the sacrificial system that was, was in the Old Testament, it, it was just an atonement. It didn't solve the problem. Uh, the blood never actually removed sin or forgave sin. It was just an atonement. And the idea there is that blood is the currency. Blood is, the life is in the blood. In fact, Leviticus, uh, um, I, we just read that, didn't we? Leviticus 17, 11. Let me read that again. For the life of a creature is in its blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. The, everything is about the blood. So in the Old Testament, you see a picture of Christ in the sacrifices of the spotless lamb that was sacrificed. Well, Jesus was the only perfect 
human ever. He is God in the flesh and he alone is the only one that can fulfill this task that God has to be able to unite us with Christ. So that is the idea. That is the idea of the new covenant is that God in our place went and was that lamb that was slaughtered in our place so that we can have atonement for our sins. So let, let's read a few passages um, to back this up. The first one is Hebrews 9.11. So now we're into the New Testament. We're going to flip midway through. We're Hebrews 9.11. Make sure I got my marking. Hebrews 9.11. Hebrews is a phenomenal book if you want to see uh, the chapters that I'm going to reference here. is a great read if you want to see an explanation of the old covenant and how Jesus is a fulfillment of that. Why? Because this letter is written to the Jews. It is written to the Jews to say that, look, your Messiah has come. Jesus is your Messiah that was foretold. So this entire book of Hebrews is designed to explain to the Jew why Jesus is the fulfillment of the Messiah. So we are going to pick it up on Hebrews 9.11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. So the idea there is that we talked about the tabernacle system, that you had the tent, and then Solomon builds this gorgeous, massive temple. And what, what the author here is saying is, is that Jesus is the greatest of them because he comes through the tabernacle that's not created of human hands. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption, the blood of the goats and the bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremonially unclean, sanctified them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness consciences for, from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins, of, sins, from the sins committed under the first covenant. Uh, continuing on, chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would have no longer have guilt or felt guilt for their sins. But those sacrifices for an annual reminder of sins, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. This is Jesus talking to God. Sacrifice and offer you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Now that's an important thing, just a little tangent there. It is written about me in the scroll. What does that mean? For those of you who have ever been to a Jewish temple, to a synagogue, and seen the Torah, Torah isn't a book like this. It's a massive scroll. It's one continuous piece of paper that has two scrolls, and they wind it to go through the scriptures as they go through it. Hi, Lexi. Yes, hi. They, they wind it up. Yeah, no, no, I'm not going to pet you, and you aren't getting any of this bread. They wind it, and it's a gigantic scroll. So what Jesus is saying here is, is that I am throughout the scroll. Another way to look at this, another verse for this, is the road to Emmaus. In Luke, we see this, uh, Luke 24. In between, when Jesus has been crucified, and he's been buried, and he's disappeared, 
in this time, there's a period of time in which Jesus appears in his resurrected state to over, over 500 people, eyewitnesses, see Jesus. And what happens is Jesus joins two of his disciples as they're walking on the road to Emmaus. It's an amazing story to read. And he teaches them and talks to them and talks to them about how he is in the entire book. He is the whole book. It's all written about Jesus. Jesus is the culmination of the Old Testament. That's the idea here. He is throughout the scroll. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. <clears throat> day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. For he, first he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I'll write them on their minds. We just read that. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Through Jesus, we are able to be in unity with God. And also, I don't know if you caught that, but in Hebrews 9, 11 through 15, it references the holy place, the holy of holies. We're going to get to this. Uh, in, in not a couple of days, but uh, in a few weeks when we talk about uh, the moment that Jesus dies on the cross. There's a massive earthquake. And then in the temple, there is a gigantic curtain, super thick. It's over a foot thick that divides the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. It's all inside the temple, but it's a room that's divided and it has this massive, huge, thick curtain. The moment that Christ died, that huge curtain was torn in two, completely ripped. The symbolism there is obvious. The idea, no longer does a priest once a year go and be able to talk to God. We, the Gentiles, not the Jews even, but the Gentiles are able to go, don't eat, don't lick the bread. She's trying to... The bread does smell really good, and she's getting hungry for it. You don't get any of it. Sorry. It's distracting me. <clears throat> um, I was on a roll too, dog. Um, <laughs> okay, so the idea being is, is that through the new covenant, we, each of us, Jew and Gentile, Gentile alike, are able to be in the presence of God, to speak directly to God. We don't need an intercessor. We don't need a priest. We don't have to go and, and pay money through indulgences to be able to have our sins forgiven. Jesus did that for us. That's the idea of the new covenant. Okay, so now we are coming back to um, Matthew 26, verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread and we had given thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. We're gonna do that in just a second, but I'm gonna go through it and explain this one more time. This is significant. Obviously, it's very significant. But the reason why it's important that we break the bread, when you take communion at church, you get that little wafer, just this little tiny it's almost like styrofoam. It's a little styro styrofoam circle is what lots of places do. Some people will do uh, broken up matzah, which is basically a saltine cracker. Uh, some people even use saltine crackers. Um, but the reason why it's important that when you take communion, you break that. I spoke earlier, who 
is responsible for Jesus going to the cross? Is it Judas? Is it Caiaphas? Is it the Sanhedrin? Is it the Jews? The whole point of the breaking of the bread is to individually, one-on-one, -on -one, take ownership of the fact that Jesus died for you. Individually, you who are listening and watching this right now, Christ did all of this specifically for you. If no one else was saved through this, he still would have done this. So that's why it's important that the symbolism of breaking the bread is acknowledging the fact that you are responsible for Christ's death on the cross. It's important. Then he took a cup and we giving thanks, he gave it, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. We spoke about this. Blood is everything. It is the currency. Without blood, you cannot have the remission of sins. So when you take the cup and drink of it, you are acknowledging the fact that Jesus shed his blood in your place so that you then can have your name written in the book of life and that we, for eternity, can be in the presence of God in heaven. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We spoke about this a few weeks ago, Matthew 24. The first of the two talks that I did on Matthew 24, I spoke specifically about the marriage feast of the Lamb. Actually, I think I talked about it in both of them. The marriage feast of the Lamb. This is the celebration. This, I believe, in an eschatological perspective, that we are going to have the rapture of the church in which the believers, Jew, Gentile, like anybody who calls on Christ as their Savior, will be caught up, and then we will go and we will celebrate in the marriage feast of the Lamb. And this is the moment Christ is talking about right here. He is saying at the Last Supper, I am not going to celebrate the Passover. I'm not going to drink of this vine. He's not going to have wine until I celebrate with you again the marriage feast of the Lamb, the, the fulfillment of the covenant. We will celebrate and we will all sit together and we will enjoy the fruit of the vine then together. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I think that's important to mention. Some people... Um, worship, the singing of songs at church and church services. It's important. And that's one thing that in this pandemic, when a lot of people are doing home church, which is what my wife and I are doing, um, it's the one thing that's missed. We still do worship. We still sing the songs, but it's different. When you're at church and you are surrounded by believers, you can feel it. You can feel the presence of the Lord as, as you are surrounded by believers that all together in one voice are worshiping their creator. And that's what Jesus does here, is that at the end of this process, they, they sang a hymn. They gave thanks and they praised God. Then they went up to the Mount of Olives. So now we are going to uh, take communion. But before we do, there's one thing that I want to talk about. And that is the difference of the practices of taking communion. So there's different perspectives. On the one hand of communion, you have one perspective where there, there are people who believe and Christian organizations who teach that when you take communion, that bread literally becomes Jesus' body. And that that cup literally becomes Jesus' blood when you take of it. Now, this is also one of the reasons why many people uh, in, in times past when they read this said that Christians were cannibals because they talk about eating their Lord and Savior. The reason why I do not believe in the Eucharist to that extent that it transforms to the actual physical blood and body is that Jesus here says that this represents my body. Do this in remembrance of me. 
He says that, do this in remembrance of me for both the bread and the cup. It's right there. That's why I believe that it is not a literal body and blood, but it is a figurative representation. That is also why I think it's totally fine for anybody and everybody to take communion when you like, because Jesus says, do this in a, as a regular basis, as a practice, do this in remembrance of me and an acknowledgement of the new covenant. That's why I'm not a priest, I'm not a pastor, but I can take communion. You can take communion. It's a great practice to have. The first time that I ever did communion outside of a church was actually at my in-laws. It was before they were my in-laws, my wife's parents. In fact, they gave us this, uh, this plate is a communion plate that we have. And we went over for Sunday dinner, and after we had dinner, they're like, we're gonna do communion. I'm like, uh, are you allowed to do that? Can we, are you a priest? Are we allowed to take communion? Uh, I was a new believer, but, but I didn't know. I was like, well, this is a very, you know, we have to say the words, we gotta do the thing. And no, anybody can do it. And that's, that's the beauty of it. That's the whole point of the new covenant is, is that there's no intercessor other than Christ in between us and God. So you don't, it's my opinion that you don't have to, 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 to enjoy the celebration of the, the Lord's Supper in a church from a priest. Now, the one thing that I want to say on the opposite side is I do believe that there is a, a irreverence. There is a, um, in some churches, and I've experienced this myself, especially in the big box uh, churches where you see uh, people get up in lines, they go get their wafer, they go get their little plastic cup, they go, they sit down, the music is playing, they break, eat, take the shot, and then they go on their way. I think that's just as problematic. And the reason being is, is that um, we're supposed to be reverent with the idea of this. And in fact, let's flip over. The last passage that I have for us uh, is 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, if I wrote it down wrong, uh, but I have it marked here properly. So it's 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three. 23. Why don't you flip there with me? Um, the idea here, so this is uh, one of Paul's epistles. So this is the early church. And what's happening here is the apostle Paul, the apostles have gone out throughout the Middle East and they are starting churches. They are going in there, preaching the gospel, they are traveling, they are starting up churches, and then those churches are starting up other churches. And this is the idea of church planting, is spelled out in Acts, which we're gonna dig into very shortly. This is a letter that's written by Paul to the church in Corinth. And anytime you have humans involved, you're gonna have dissension, you're gonna have Things be messed up. And that's even in the brand new church, you have it. So this is a situation in which Paul is correcting the people of Corinth on how they are treating the Lord's Supper. So this is uh, Paul explaining to the Corinthians how they're supposed to properly take communion. So let's, let's read on, uh, so passage, chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I have passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and we'd given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup uh, of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it and remember, in remembrance of me. Now, this is the important part why I read this. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an un worthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So what is Paul telling us here? There's a couple of things. One, he's guiding us. Before you take the Lord's Supper, it's important, Paul is saying, that you examine yourself and you make sure you are acknowledging who you are 
and who God is and what that relationship is. I actually, uh, this morning, I met with my small group and I mentioned that I was doing this today and we started talking about um, the Lord's Supper. And he, one of the guys in the group, mentioned something to me that I'm gonna share with you that I love. And he heard this from a pastor uh, in a message where before you take communion, you need to first analyze and pray about your relationship with God and ask the question, is there anything that is in my life, any sin, any specific thing that is keeping me from you, Lord, anything that is dividing us? Because the Bible talks about the fact that if you are living in sin, you will feel a separation from God. You will not have the closeness of God if there's something that you are practicing. If there's something in your life that you need to remove, it hinders that relationship. So before you take communion, you should pray to God and ask, what's, what is hindering our relationship? On a vertical level, God, what is blocking me from you? What is hindering me from really truly being in communion with you? Then, after you pray for illumination in that regard, pray horizontally for this question. Among my fellow believer, is there somebody that has something against me or I have against them that's preventing me from being a good witness, from being salt and light to them? Is there something that somebody has against me that I need to rectify? Is there something that I am refusing to forgive someone else for that I need to rectify? So before you take communion, you need to take the time to examine and pray to God for him to show you what's hindering your relationship with him and what relationships do you need to mend horizontally. Then, then you can approach the table. Now, one more thing that I wanna mention that Paul talks about here is, is this idea that if you are not a believer, you shouldn't take communion. And there are times at which this might seem, when, if you visit a church for the first time and they take communion and then you see the pastor get up and say, if you aren't a believer, please stay seated. Seems rather elitist and like only members of our church can stand up and drink our grape juice and eat our piece of styrofoam. No, the idea there is an important one. For if you are not a believer and you take communion, what you're doing is you are acknowledging that for you, Christ was killed. But if you, receive, if you refuse that gift, you refuse to acknowledge that gift that was given to you, well, you are fully pulling judgment on yourself because you're openly saying, yes, Christ died but I don't accept the gift. That is a scary thought and something that you should be cautious of. So that's why before we actually take communion, which we're gonna do now, I think that's important. So from here on out, anytime you take communion, make sure the first thing that you do is you pray to God and ask where are you at with him and then you pray horizontally. So now gather your elements and we are gonna take communion together. So first, we have the bread. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I have here, this is naan is what it's called, but it is uh, unleavened bread, it's flat bread, and it makes phenomenal pizza. If you wanna make a really quick pizza, and I have to be honest with you, that's what I'm gonna do right after this. I have some uh, cheese and, and some tomato sauce. And it's a great way, just put a little tomato sauce in there, a little cheese, Mwah, beautiful, delicious. Sorry, we're in this great reverent moment and I bring a little too much levity to it. So this is very likely, the reason why I have this is um, if you look it up, this is very likely similar to what the bread was like that Jesus used in the celebration of the Passover Seder because it's unleavened bread. Now you do have matzah, uh, which you could do, use matzah, which that is what is actually used traditionally today when you do a Jewish Seder. But the stuff tastes like cardboard. I'm sorry, but I've had it before. And it, it saltines taste better. So I did actually pick up what with 
uh, uh, Passover being uh, uh, the uh, uh, the Passover celebration being right around the corner. It's in the grocery stores. You can find it. There's end caps. I saw this morning when I went to buy this stuff. There was an end caps end cap in the grocery store for a Jewish seder. It had all the things that were there, all the pickled things, and and it had the matzah. And it's like, no, this tastes so much better. So I'm choosing to use this, uh, but y- you could easily take a loaf of bread. You can take whatever you want. So. Take your element, and the important thing to do is to take some time right now, and before I break this, I'm going to pause briefly and allow some time for each of us. If you're driving, obviously keep your eyes open and keep driving, but if you're not, if you're at home, I want you to pray. Take some time to pray. I'm going to pause. If you hear me start talking and you're not done talking to God, pause me, keep talking to God, keep that going, and then make sure you do hit play again because we need to keep going. So now I'm just going to pause for a moment. And for me personally, I'm just going to be praying about what in my life is hindering my relationship with you vertically and is there anything horizontally that's hindering my relationship with others? taking your bread. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he gave him thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you go ahead and break your bread and partake? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the new covenant. It it seems such an odd thing to pray. It's such a massive thing that you did. But I give thanks for it. Thank you for the example that you gave us in the Last Supper of how we are supposed to celebrate the sacrifice that you made on the cross for us. Thank you for your body broken for us. And thank you, Lord, for giving your blood in our place so that we might be united with God. Lord, I pray right now that you will Speak to each person that's listening right now and that you will grow your relationship with them and that you will increase a hunger in their hearts to speak to you every day and that they would have a hunger and a desire to grow the relationship with you and to invest into that relationship. And that, Lord, in the future, when they do celebrate the Lord's Supper, that they would make sure to do it with reverence an acknowledgement of who you are, and that they would come humbly 
bowing before you, acknowledging our brokenness before you and who you are in the sacrificial lamb that was killed for me and for them. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's it for this week. I hope this has been educational. Uh, next week, we are going to see Jesus betrayed and arrested. So have a great week, and I'll see you guys next time.